let God be God and me be his son and have him take care of me. And when that's the order of things, I'm letting God be God and he, I'm his son and he's taking care of me and I'm trying to be a service to his kids, then things happen incredibly fast and you can't keep up with it. And that's what's happened to me. And my life, it's been a dream in Dallas. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. That was the voice of Mr. Reno John that you heard at the beginning of this episode again. And you are going to hear so much more from him in just a moment. But first things first, this episode right here. Right now is brought to you by Miss Victoria. Victoria, you know what she did. She went to our website, SoberSpeak.com. She clicked on the little yellow donate tab and she made a contribution. Thank you very much, Miss Victoria. This episode is coming right out to you. As usual, we are going to let all the other people listen in with us at the same time because we are giving and generous people. Thank you very much, Victoria. I, John M., will be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you listening in. So take a seat, if you will, around this virtual table, and let's get started. Our next Sober Speak Live event is going to be on June 5th, Friday at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And uh, all of the information, the, the, what do you call it, the Zoom ID, all that stuff will be posted on our website. It'll be posted in so- on social media. And you can go there, look that up. And if you have any questions and you just want to email me at John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com regarding that event to figure all figure it all out, uh, feel more than free to uh, send an email my way. Uh, I, this is the great thing about Zoom meetings is that we can all get together and uh, be able to... Uh, uh, just spend some time together. In other words, uh, in the past, when I've had these live events, as you know, you have to come to North Texas and no mas, ladies and gents, no matter where you are, you can attend. We're probably going to have some live music for it again on the beginning of this. And as I did with Mr. Bill C, I'm going to ask some questions for David G on the front end, but I would love for you to join in on the party and ask your own questions during the event. Uh, and last time it was really, uh, I, I enjoyed the Q and a uh, much better than I did the, uh, the first part of it. Not that the first part wasn't good, but I just loved the Q and a. I thought it was great. If you would like to, um, how do we, I like post uh, some information regarding the live event with uh, David G on June 5th, Friday at 7 p.m. You can either steal the information off of our website and post it in your, your 
AA groups or recovery groups or whatever you belong to. Uh, you know, anyway, you could do that, uh, or you can reach out to me. I'll have a flyer prepared and I can send that to you. You can post it, uh, even if you're, um, going to AA meetings again, uh, and you want to post that particular flyer at your group, reach out to me at John, J O H N, at silverspeak.com, and I will get you all the necessary, uh, information. This meeting is an open AA meeting and all are welcome. If you are not part of the secret Facebook group, by the way, when I first started doing this, I didn't, I didn't have a, a Facebook account. I didn't know anything about these Facebook accounts. And somebody said to me, you ought to make it a secret Facebook account. And I was like, what is a secret Facebook account? If you are out there and you have no idea what that is, well, I completely understand. Basically, a secret Facebook group works like this. And we don't do it because we're trying to be exclusive, if you will. All are welcome. Anybody can come in. But due to anonymity, we don't want the group to be found by just a general search on Facebook. So if you want to be in that, uh, people can't see that you're in it. Uh, in fact, I understand it's even uh, a little bit, there's further security on it than I think what's called a, 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 a private group or a closed group, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure you can Google all this and figure it out or ask a neighbor. They'll know. But if you want to be in on the group, send me your email associated with your Facebook account. That's important, associated with your Facebook account to John, J O H N, at soberspeak.com, and we will get you on in there. You have a lot of like minded uh, people that are in recovery, AA, Al Anon, and otherwise, and uh, they just, there's all kinds of information that are shared in there, and we would love to have you as part of it as well. If you're not following me on Instagram, I'm at Sober speak, all one word, and we would love to see you there in uh, following us on Instagram. All right, now on to Mr. Reno, John, part two. And I want to make an amends to Mr. Reno, John. And last week, I said that Re Reno, John, uh, was uh, a 30 years sober, and it's actually he is almost 40 years sober. So you know, that 10 years means a lot and uh, he doesn't care, but I just wanted to uh, uh, let it be known that I realized that after the episode was actually published. But in this particular conversation, we, when I say we, Reno, John and I have a little bit of a, a more relaxed conversation than we did last week. We address uh, things like John's uh, marathoning adventures, uh, his involvement with a conference called the Lone Star Roundup. Uh, we address uh, things like a uh, Zoom meetings during COVID nineteen, and we go to more. We go into more of John's story about how he got from Dallas, from Reno, Nevada, and so much more. So buckle up, enjoy the ride, and I will have listener feedback at the end of John's episode. Enjoy, everybody. Okay, everybody. So we are back again with Mr. John A. And uh, we, we uh, oh gosh, uh, we spent some time with John A. last time and I just had such a good time. I asked him if he would come back and he has so graciously agreed to do so. So here we are, we are back again. So Mr. John, John, why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself and give your sobriety date if you wish, sir. Yeah, I'm John a, and I'm an alcoholic, and uh, by the grace of God and the fellowship of AA, I've been sober since October 7th, 1981, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So I'm glad to be here. It's good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, and uh, if I remember right from last time, that's right at 39 years sobriety. Am I right, sir? I have 39 this year. Yeah. Well, I wondered that, first of all, when, when we spoke last time, we had just kind of, you came up to the point of basically just getting sober. Uh, you hadn't even got to Dallas yet. And uh, I know, I, I believe most of your sobriety, in fact, if not all of it, uh, well, d just a small portion on the beginning. And then most all of it has been in uh, Dallas since that point, I believe. I moved to Dallas when I was a year and a half sober. Been okay. here ever since. 
Um, I, I, but I wanted to talk to you about a couple of a uh, couple of uh, just off the cuff items before we before we go into your story a little bit more. I, when we were uh, catching up uh, earlier, you had mentioned that you are a uh, marathoner. Uh, am I right? So tell me about that and and how that. Were you always a marathoner? Uh, you know, did that just come up lately? T- talk to me a little bit about that. No, what happened was uh, when I was in high school, I ran. I ran the mile in high school and, and it was pretty good. Uh, it was all state and, and all that. But uh, then, I, then I started drinking and I hadn't run for years. And then my wife and I started walking around the block. I, it's probably been 20 years ago. We started, you know, walking around the block and then we added a block and walking around two blocks. And then Christmas came and we started walking through the blocks we're all around our house, looking at the Christmas lights. And then my wife said, I want to run, but I don't want to run outside. I had people watch my butt jiggle. So I bought her a, for Christmas that year, I bought her a, a, a you know, a running machine, whatever you call treadmill. it. Treadmill? A treadmill. And we, we ran the treadmill. Well, she was fine on the treadmill. It cut my knees to pieces. It, mm-hmm. I could hardly walk after running on the treadmill. So I started to run outside. She ran on the treadmill, and then she she joined me outside, and we started running. We got up to where we were running. I had read where you need to, you need to exercise 40 minutes at a time to, for your best cardio workout. So we would run 40 I have no idea how far it was, but we would run 40 minutes. We would run 20 minutes one way and turn around and come back 20 minutes the other way. And then we got to where we were running pretty good, and we both enjoyed it a lot. And uh, then she broke her toe and couldn't run. And so I would run, and I started adding a block. That's about it. Just add a block at a time on. And I got to where I was, and I started driving to see how far am I running. This is before... I had a GPS and all that stuff to know where I was going. And so I would get in the car and I would drive my route where I ran to see where I was running. I'd run five miles and ten mi- or six miles and seven. I got probably run about eight miles a day. And I thought, I wonder how much you have to run to run a marathon. So I mm-hmm. you know, went on the internet and found out. And I thought, well, they're running. I'm running as much as they are, you know, for training. So I started running and, and uh, I have a niece that lives in St. George, Utah. And they have a, one of the most popular marathons in the country out of St. George. It's beautiful. You run through the canyon lands, those red canyons of uh, the canyon lands in Utah. And she had run that uh, St. George marathon a couple of times. And I forget what it, how it happened, but I, oh, she wished me a happy birthday on my birthday, which, which is today, by the way. And, oh. uh, well, happy so, birthday. Well, thank you. And that's my natal birthday. So anyway, I sent back and I said, well, when are we going to run a marathon? She sent back and said, Uncle John, are you serious? And I said, yes, I'm serious. So she said, how about October? That's when the marathon is. So that was the first marathon I ran was in October, the St. George Marathon. And that was five years ago. And uh, and we've been, I've run it every year since then. I, run a couple, I ran the, the the Dallas Marathon here and, and uh and so I'm going to run that. I, I want to run. I don't know whether it'll, it'll work out or not. I want to run the, uh, there's a marathon in Provo, Utah, called Utah Valley Marathon, which is great because you go up above the Utah, the dam, Deer Creek Dam, and, uh, Provo Canyon, and you run back to downtown Provo. And that's a beautiful run. You, the problem with Texas is it's flat. I mean, when the highest point is the overpass, it's real boring, mm-hmm. you know? Right. <laughs> but uh, to run through that that Utah Valley Canyon, and you got two waterfalls you run by, and you got a river there that's running by. It's just beautiful run, and so that's in June, the first weekend of June. So I'm probably going to run that in June. So I well, that's in- interesting to me that you started running marathons at over 30 years sober. Yeah, yeah, I'm 69. So I've had my first marathon at 64. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that is fantastic. I mean, yeah. do you see a lot of first-time marathoners at sixty-four when you're at these events? Not many, you know. But uh, I, I'm going to try to run Boston this next year. Yeah, I have to qualify for Boston, 
and you got to run a four hour marathon, four hour and five minute marathon, which I've trained to do, but I've just never done it. But I think that's probably one of the, one of the, uh, boxes I want to check off. I want to, I want to run Boston. So we'll see how that works out this year. So I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about, we were, you know, we were having some telephone calls and we were getting ready for this. And uh, I know you had a long history with the, uh, the Lone Star Roundup, I think is what it was yeah. called here yeah. in Texas. And uh, talk to me about your uh, involvement in that organization. And it, it's, it's no longer around. Am I, am I correct? No, about that? no, it went under <laughs> that, that we were talking about that because of Zoom and all the meetings on Zoom now. And uh, and the thing that brought that to my mind when we were talking about it was that anytime there's a change of technology, you know, AAs go nuts. We 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 the traditions are in jeopardy. We don't do that and all this stuff. And and I was telling you that it reminds me of what happened when they first started to record conventions, AA conventions. And man, the old timers like me were opposed to that. Because, you know, uh, uh, these tapers are making money. My God, you can't make money on Alcoholics Anonymous. They're making money on it and it's breaking the traditions. And then they're taping it. They're going to spread those tapes around. Who's going to get those tapes? And we don't know who's going to listen to those tapes. And, it, and on and on and on and on. And, on. and uh, today it's just come to place. And Lone Star, when they started 55 years ago, wherever, it's been a long time. I don't know when it exactly started. But they their their committee elected not to record it. And so none of the Lone Star and everybody from Bill Wilson and Clancy and all those guys spoke at Lone Star. It was, it got to where it was a 4,000, uh, attended by 4,000 drunks. I mean, it was a big conference and, uh, they had a committee in back of the committee that really ran it. And it, the chairman was always appointed to a lifetime position of the committee in back of the committee. You never knew who was in that that real committee running the thing. It was really funny because they were very mm-hmm. anonymous. That's how they kept it. That we're very anonymous in that, in that thing. And, uh, and so they, they asked me, I'd been, I'd been usher when I first moved here in 83, they asked me to be on the usher. I was usher and I loved being an usher. And then I was on the, the uh, registration committee. And then they said, I started speaking around a lot and they said, why don't you be on our speaker committee? Cause you know, a lot of these guys we want to hear speak. And so I went on the speaker committee and the first committee we had, uh, they, they gave us five tapes and they said, now take these two tapes home, listen to them and then bring your favorite tape back and maybe your favorite two tapes back. And then we'll pass those around and come up with the speakers we want to invite to the conference. And so I did that. And I said to him, I said, wait a minute, you want me to take these tapes, listen to these tapes and then bring the tape back. So we're going to decide who we invite to speak at the conference by listening to these tapes. Yeah. And yet we don't allow the tapes that this conference to be taped. <laughs> <laughs> the next week, the next week, Ron called me and said, we've decided you'd probably be best to be of service if you were back in the usher. <laughs> 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 so anyway, so anyway, don't get upset about these zoom meetings, you know, uh, yeah. breaking the traditions and my God, this and that happened and, and being hijacked. I've been in a meeting that was hijacked, you know, and nobody got drunk, okay? <laughs> and we've given out desire chips and uh, to, to the newcomers. We gave. I was at a meeting last night uh, via and, Zoom. Yeah, via Zoom. You know, I've spoken a lot of Zoom meetings, and I've been on Zoom. I last night we were. I was at primary or PPG twenty is the name of the of the group, and we had uh, thirty people there, and and a gal. Wanted a sponsor. It was her first being wanted to get a sponsor. And so the girl stayed after and, and talked to her via Zoom. And and I assume that they're going to hook up and, and take care of that gal. So uh, this will all get worked out and the, and the technology worked out. And I don't su- I suspect that Zoom is going to change the face of AA forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, or some, some other platform. I don't know how it's going to work out. It's not my deal. Whatever God wants it to do, it's going to be. You know, yeah, and and those other platforms and Zoom yeah. has already come up with the additional security features uh, to help yeah. them, you know keep people from what they call Zoom bombing. So, how do you like uh, speaking at those meetings? What is it? What's it's it no like fun. for you, really? 
Yeah, it's not it's not the excitement it is when you're at a in a live meeting because you have no feedback. You know, you, you don't know whether are they listening to me? Hello, are you there? You don't have any feedback because they, they mute all the mics and they need to because you never know, like my cat was meowing earlier <laughs> when you and I were here. But uh, <laughs> so they you don't you don't know where you are. You don't know what, how you're connecting with them. You don't know what's going on. Uh, but you get caught up in it and uh, and the spirit takes over because this is a God deal. You know, the reality is, is that without God, none of this works anyway. The, mm-hmm. the face to face meetings don't work if God's not there. That's right. And uh, and the Zoom meetings won't work if God's not there. But in the meetings I've been at and those I've spoke at, and I had a had a fun experience out of a group out of Ohio that that uh, a lot of people attended that, and it was fun. And and uh, but it's not the same. But I think it'll. I think somehow it'll it'll help people. I don't think it'll go away. You know, right? Just, and right now, if you and, think can't wait till we get back and we can hug each other, that will happen. Right. But I think Zoom will. Zoom will also be a prevalent part of AA. That's if it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm no problem. Yeah. I'm not and like you and I spoke about recently, and we're we're fortunate enough to live in an area to where you can find a meeting very near us. A lot of people live in rural areas, or they, for whatever reason, health reasons, or they just had a baby, or something like that, they can't get to a meeting, and so this is a good uh, supplement, if you will. The Zoom yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I hope they stay around. All right, so let's get back into your story a little bit. So last time we got together, basically you were just kind of starting to get sober. You hadn't made it to Dallas yet. Why don't you pick us up from that point and move forward? Yeah, I think I left off where I was at I was at the uh, state hospital and Conklin come up and talk to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and told me I couldn't, you know that that obviously I hadn't taken the third step because he said, you know, you, uh, the reason I know you haven't taken the step because I, I was living in my car. I'm living in my car. I'm 135 pounds. I got no place to live. I got no food to eat. I got no money. I got no job. I'm just bankrupt in every department, and I'm a year and a half sober. And and Conklin says, you know, you need to take the third step. And uh, I'm saying I took it. He said, no, you haven't, because the third step says we made a decision to turn our world life over to the care of God. That means God is going to take care of you from that time on. The reason I know you haven't taken that step is because God takes better care of his kids than the way you're living. Mm. And I said, you can't argue with that. How are you going to argue with that? If you were God, would you let your kid live like that? So if God's not taking care of me, who's taking care of me? It's got to be me. And so I said, how do you do that? He said, oh, you can't. And he said, are you, are you, uh, are you praying for stuff? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm praying for stuff. Uh, are you praying for food? Yeah. Are you praying for a job? Yeah. So you don't need to pray for a job. God knows you need, you need a job. Are you praying for a place to live? I said, yeah, I have, I'm homeless. He said, you don't need to pray for a place to live. God knows you need a place to live. He knows you need to eat. And I said, well, if you don't pray for that, what am I going to pray for? And he said, uh, well, if you knew what God wanted you to do, God wants me to go do that. And you have the power to go do that, whatever that is. Don't you think you'd be okay? And I said, yeah. He said, then you pray only for a knowledge of God's will for you and the power to carry that out. And he and, uh, and said, hey, if you can do that, he said, I want to promise you, God will start taking care of you so fast. You won't be able to keep up with it. Mm. And I knew it ha- had to happen pretty quick. Because, I mean, I, my nose is running. It's cold. It's snowing outside. And I ain't going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And so I left there, and I was staying at the MGM Grand. Well, in the parking lot of the MGM Grand. <laughs> 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 what I'd do is I'd park in there and then I'd go in the casino and I'd walk around the casinos up and down rows and rows of slot machines looking for nickels, dimes, and quarters. I'd drink coffee. I'd stay warm. I had to wear a little tie because I'm looking for a job. And uh, and so they they didn't know I was homeless. And I'd go out and go to bed about 4 o'clock. And I'd kind of stay warm. And I would sleep in the front seat of my car. I went out there about 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, – Somebody loaned me a sleeping bag from AA to sleep in my car. So I'm sleeping in my car and I'm petrified. 
Because I know something's got to happen, and it's got to happen pretty quick because I ain't going to make it. And my prayer that night wasn't any, any, I don't even know what I said. But I remember begging God to let me know what you want me to do. Just let me know what to do, God, and I'll go do it. But I don't know what to do. I've done everything I know what to do, and I don't know what to do. I'm living my car, and and, and I was done. I was tired. It's very tiring being homeless. You don't really you sleep, but you don't really sleep. And I'm hungry, and I'm tired, and I'm just begging God. And there weren't any bolts of lightning, you know. Uh, I just went to sleep, and got up the next morning. Nothing changed. I went down and walked to the shell station, shaved, and, and took a sponge bath. Put on my tie. Went to the southeast part of Reno to look, check on some applications I'd put in at 7-Eleven. Went to, I'm downtown Reno, so I go to the St. Mary's Hospital, which is downtown Reno, to a meeting at 8.30. After the meeting, I'm downtown, so I'm walking around the Hilton. I'm not looking for a job. I'm looking for Nicholas Diamonds and Quarters. It's Saturday. And I'm looking for Nicholas Diamonds and Quarters. And I'm getting ready to go out and go to bed about 3.30 in the morning. And I got a job. I wasn't looking for a job. I'm looking for nickels, dimes, and quarters. You know? Pretty good to get a job Sunday morning at 3.30. <laughs> but I got a job Sunday morning at 3.30 in the morning. And I started working at the Hilton graveyard shift. So I was going to work that night. And I started work that night. I, I, I passed out. I sold nickels, dimes, and quarters to slot machine players. Carried a change bill around. Sold. Paid me four bucks an hour. And one meal a day. Best job I could have got. You know, because it paid me four bucks an hour and one meal a day. Now, where I don't care if I got a job paid me ten thousand a month. You got to work a couple weeks get a paycheck. Where I have eaten, but I got one meal a day at the employee lunchroom and four bucks an hour. And I started at midnight that night, and I went to work. Got off work at eight o'clock Monday morning. Ran down to the central office where my sponsor was working. And uh, tell him about this job I got, and he's crying. I'm crying. We're Smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, talking about God, and the phone rings. He took the phone, long pause. He said, yeah, I know him. Talked for a little bit, another long pause. And he says, well, he's sitting right here. Hang on. He gives me the phone. I took the phone. It was a guy named Humphreys, Doc Humphreys. He was a medical doctor, but uh, lives next door to my parents. And I said, Doc, what are you doing calling me? He said, well, I was talking to your mom over the weekend. Mom and dad, they're worried sick about you. See, I couldn't call my mom, you know, because uh, he told me, I don't want you to borrow any money from your mom. You borrow money from your mom, get a new sponsor, because that may kill you. And he told me, he said, you need to talk, talk to mom. You tell me, I'll call her for you. Well, what are you going to tell your sponsor? Will you call my mommy? No, <laughs> not going to do that. So uh, he said, they're worried sick about you. And I said, well, where is he? And they said, well, last we heard he's in Reno. He said, well, I'm going to Reno tomorrow. I'll call the cops, see if they got him. They said, no, we've called him. They don't have him. They don't think about John already. But call AA. He's supposed to be sober in AA. Maybe AA knows where he is. So I got in town this morning, call AA. Hell, there you are. I said, oh, yeah, I'm sober in AA. He said, you working? I said, absolutely. Got a job at the Hilton. <laughs> you know, we can't tell him how bad it is. We can't tell him. He just got the job <laughs> last night. So we got, and he said, are you, where are you living? I said, well, I'm moving. <laughs> he says, he says uh, have you signed the lease I said no but I'm going to and he said well don't see although he was a doctor he no longer practiced medicine he was a contractor he built homes he's a developer he built homes he says I'm building a subdivision instead now instead is eight miles north of Reno he says, I'm building a subdivision instead sold a lot of homes got a lot more to sell but somebody's stealing from me out there every, every week they're stealing dishwashers they're stealing paint lumber supplies. I don't know who it is, but I think I know who it is. But I got a house next to his. I haven't sold yet. If I turn the utilities on in that house, will you come out there and live in that house and keep an eye on things at night and on weekends? Mm. I said, well, I'll come out and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> See, in 48 hours, God had done for me what I couldn't do for myself. And he started taking care of me. And that, con that promise that conquer made me come true. You can't keep up with it. Can't keep up with it. My sister called me or sent me a 
a Christmas card. I'm living out in that place, working at the Hilton for four bucks an hour. Get a card from Christmas card from my sister. And I call her on the phone, thank her for the card, call her a collect because I don't have a phone. And uh, <laughs> so I call her collect. And she uh, she said, I hear you work at the Hilton. I said, yeah, I got a job at the Hilton. And she said, how much are they paying you? I said, four bucks an hour and one meal a day. She laughs. She says, this was in 83, uh, 82, uh, December of 8, Christmas of 82. And she said, you can get a job in Dallas doing anything for more than four bucks an hour. And Dallas was booming. This was in 82, and the, and the economy had just coming out of a terrible recession, you know. Uh, and it was, it was, but oil and gas had gone up to 50 bucks the first time that it ever happened. And, and Dallas rocks, Texas rocks at $50 oil, you know. Mm-hmm. Back then, it was incredible. There's money everywhere in Dallas. And I said, No, I'm fine. I'm fine. She said, No, she's you need to come out here. I said, No, I'm fine. So she sends me the classified ad section. It's bigger than our whole newspaper. Here, all these jobs. I look at these jobs and I talk to my sponsor. I said, man, look at all these jobs they got out there and the money they're making. But I don't want to take, I don't want to take a sober geographic. You know, I heard about that. I don't want to take a sober geographic. And he said, well, it's pretty simple. I said, how do you know? And he said, well, do you, do you want to go? You got some athlete you want to go see? I said, no, I don't really want to go. He said, you need to go. You need to get out of Reno. You got a warrant for your arrest out here. You need to get rid of. He said, no, I don't need to go. He said, you have to go. You got some girl you're chasing out there. You have to go see. I said, no, I don't have to go. He said, well, it's simple. You don't want to go. You don't need to go. You don't have to go. Well, hell, then you can go. <laughs> so <laughs> I moved by UPS. I packed everything I owned up into three boxes. And uh, <laughs> the car I was living in, I threw a rod through the engine a week before I was going to leave. And oh, so no. I, I packed everything up and I sold my car for 500 bucks. And I hitchhiked from Reno, Nevada to Salt Lake City, Utah, because you could fly for $99 one way to to Dallas. That spe- American had a special going on. So I flew to not Dallas for nine. I landed in Dallas February 1 of 83. And I've uh, been here ever since. Mm. And that's how I got to Dallas. All right. Let me do a quick break. We will be continuing our conversation with John A. in just a moment. Just a reminder, you are listening to Sober Speak. You can find us on the World Wide Web at SoberSpeak.com. There you can find approximately 130 plus other episodes for free. You can also find the donate button on our website. You can use if and only if the spirit moves you to do such. Please keep in mind this is a podcast funded by you, the listener. SoberSpeak is self-supporting through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution we do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. All right. Now back to Mr. John A. All right, so now you get to Dallas. Take me from there. Well, I'm staying at my sister's place. And uh, I started going to Dallas North because I said, why? I had no car. And she lived in Richardson. So I, I called in her group and found out there was a group within walking distance of where she lived. And it was Dallas North. So that's how I ended up in mm-hmm. Dallas North. New group, small group. Got my sponsor the first week I'm in town. And uh, he uh, and I got a job first week I'm in town. And because uh, I found out how to get a job. You want a job? What you do is you have to go out and you ask, ask people that manage jobs or own jobs if they need help. <laughs> and you don't know who they are. So you have to ask a lot of them. If they manage your own job, they need help. And pretty soon some guys say, I need help. And so you take the job. So I got a job first week I'm in town. I was out of town in small in, in Mesquite. Paid me four bucks an hour. <laughs> I, took a, I took a pay cut because they didn't feed me one meal a day. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You take the job. You take the job. And after my sponsor, I got my sponsor. He found a little bit about me. And so he said, well, I'd been in the insurance business. And he, and, and he said, go down here and talk to this guy. He's in AA. And maybe he can help you, tell you give you some direction. And I said, who's he with? And he told me. And I said, no, he didn't want me. He said, you don't know that. I, I know that. I, it's a peer company, same company I used to be with. Some kind of company I used to be with. They don't want me. They want somebody that's been in the area 10 years, has a, knows a lot of people, real active in their church or in some community service, knows a lot of people. I don't know anybody. They don't want me. You don't know. I do know that. But to get him <laughs> off my back, I called Jim and uh, told him, got an appointment with him, told him who it was. And I went out to see him, and he started out. It was a big agency, big New York agency. And he said, uh, well, I've never hired anybody from the from AA. 
and I've never been able to. And I said, I know. I'm just down here to get Brown off my back. So don't worry about it. <laughs> so we talked for a little bit. He said, well, let's figure Let's fill out the paperwork. And I said, you really want to waste your time? To, yeah, let's fill out the, that's our job. We'll fill out the paperwork, see what happens. So we fill it out, send it in. And a, a week later, he calls me. And he said, who's George F? And I said, oh, God. George F. is the executive vice president of my old company I used to work for. Why? And he said, well, our vice president called me and said, are you crazy? Have you seen this guy's application? Are you crazy? You want to send you, That's nuts. And he said, listen, that's not my job. I know what his application looks like. I know he's just been in the town a while. I know he's an alcoholic. I know all that stuff. But that's not my job. My job is to fill it out and send in. You want to turn him down? That's your job. And he said, well, I'm looking at this out. You know what? I see who he used to work for. I play golf with that guy every Saturday. I'm mm. going to call that guy up and ask him about John A. And I said, oh, great. What did George have to say about John A? And he said, well, apparently he told our vice president that if you're sober and we don't hire you, he wants you to call him because he wants to hire you back if you're sober. Mm. And our vice president told him, no, we're hiring him. <laughs> and I said, I, but I can't get bonded. They won't bond me, probably. And he said, our, I asked the vice president about that. And he said, if they won't bond him, our company will bond him. Don't worry about it. Hire him. He said, George wants him back. If George wants him back. I want to hire him. Uh -huh. And so uh, he said, I can hire you. Come on now. Let's finish the paperwork. And I said, well, let's think about that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I like $4 an hour job. $4 an hour. They're happy if you show up. They don't expect much. You show up, they're happy, you know? <laughs> so I go down there to fill out the paperwork. And uh, and I, the deal was with my sister, I can stay with my sister for two months. So February, I start with, move down there and live with her. By the, uh, April, I got to move out. So I got two months to find a job, find an apartment. I got to get a car because you can't, you got to have a car if you're going to be in Dallas. Uh, you couldn't get by without that, but I need, I need to find a job and find an apartment because I got to move out first of Feb first of April. So I'm down there talking to Jim and he says to me, and it's, and, it, and the office is down on lemon. I'm up in Richardson. It's down on lemon Avenue. And he says, uh, Hey, call this guy here. This guy's not in AA. This guy doesn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm, but he's a good friend of mine. And he said, you need to be 100% honest. If you're not going to be honest with him, I'll fire you right now. I said, I'll be honest with him. He said, well, call him. Maybe he knows of a garage apartment or something. So I call the guy on the phone, tell him who I was, tell him how much money I had. So I only got 500 bucks. And, uh, and I got to find an apartment and get a car. And I got a job. So anyway, he says to me, never met this guy. To this day, I've never met this guy. He says, well, go over here to Hudno and ask. Robbie to show you the game room. He told me the place, the, the apartment complex, and asked her to show you the game room. Plantation House was the name of the place. They've torn it down now. So I find it on HUD. No, I'm talking to, I find Robbie. She's managing. I said, Robbie, he wants you to show me the game room. She said, why? I said, I don't know. He wants me to show you the game room. So we go out back and back in, in the early days of Dallas, when, when Dallas, before Dallas was wet, when Dallas was still dry, private clubs, you could, I mean, you, apartment complex to build a private club on the premise. And when you join the apartment mm -hmm. complex, one of the benefits was you could go to that bar and have a drink. And that's what this was. It was a freestanding place in the parking lot. It was second floor. The first floor was all the washing machines and that. Second floor was the the, the game room. That's what they called it. And uh, so we went up there and walked up the steps. She opened the game room door. It was, you know, it was like 11, 1200 square feet. Uh, they had a 12 foot bar that ran down this side of it. They had a freestanding fireplace in it. They had, they made it into an apartment and they had two bedrooms because they had two baths, right? So they had his and her bathroom. So they had two bedrooms. I looked at it and I thought, God, this is huge freestanding fire. I said, how much do they want for it? She said, John, I've been here nine years. We've never rented it. I don't know. So I go back and call the guy. He says, what do you think? And I said, I don't think I can afford it. I only got 500 bucks. And he said, you told me this guy I've never met. Doesn't know anything about AA. But I told him my position. I was 100% honest with him. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You give me 50 bucks, you can move in. And a month later, give me 100 bucks. And a month after that, give me 200 bucks. And a month after that, give me 300. We'll level it off at 300. And I'll pay the utilities. 
Mm -hmm. And I said, deal. And he said, we'll do month by month for as long as you want it. And he said, uh, you, I know your situation. So I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to give, do me a favor. I said, what's the favor? Anything. He said, you need to give me a couple weeks to clean it. And you can move in when I need to move out of my sister. Then move out of my sister's April 1. He said, you can move in April 1. Mm. I said, deal. So I took the money, took <laughs> Robbie a $50 money order down. Cause I was afraid to write a check because it would bounce. So I gave her a money order for 50 bucks. And she said, what's this for? And I said, I'm renting the game room. She says, is this a deposit? I said, no, that's my rent. <laughs> <laughs> she said, no. I said, yeah, that's what he said. Well, anyway, I started renting that place. Oh, and one other thing, a couple other things. It was, you know, uh, I don't have any furniture. But they were using it as storage. And they were storing furniture. So I moved into a furnished apartment for 50 bucks. Mm. And the other thing was, it was, I don't have a car, right? Well, it was, it was like three blocks from my office. So I could walk to work. Oh, wow. And, and, and the funny thing about it was I don't need to, I don't need a car because the first few weeks I'm going to be in training, right? I got to figure out what I'm doing. So they're going to train me. So I'm walking to work, got this apartment, got this job. First, I moved out. I need a car. So I'm looking for a car. They're all taking me for a car. And I found out that you can't find a car for 500 bucks that runs. My spot, my, my boss had said, if you find a car for 500, you, uh, I'll help you. Because I was down. I was down to like 350 bucks. And he said, you find a car for 500 bucks, I'll have to give you an advance for the 500 bucks. So I'm looking for a car for 500. Can't find a car for 500. I found one car that ran for 500, but it didn't have a front seat. You know? so, <laughs> but I'm bumming rides from all the agents wanting to, to having them take me out to look at cars, right? So I'm in training. I'm bumming for rides to look at cars. I'm going to Dallas North. So there's a guy that lived up in Richardson. So every night I'd ride home with him. So I go to a meeting at Dallas North. I never missed a meeting. Went to a meeting with, in Richardson uh, every night. And then I'm bumming ride back. And uh, about ready to, you know what we're going to do? Because I got to start looking. I need a car. And I'm going to, I'm finished training Monday. And my sponsor says, well, maybe God's will is that you rent a jalopy. And what will happen is but there's a company called Rent a Jalopy that you can rent cars from cheap. They're used cars. And you can rent them cheap. And uh, so he said, the deal is if you don't have a car this weekend, Monday, you go rent a jalopy because maybe God's will is you'll drive around, you'll make a sale, and I'll give you some commission. You make more than spend more than 500 bucks on the car. So that's our plan. We're going to rent a jalopy. That's our plan. So I go to work Friday, going to rent a jalopy Monday if I don't find a car. The receptionist and, and the telephone operator, she says, hey, the mobile station across the street called us. A lot of agents buy gas from him. And he's got a lady in Highland Park that uh, her sons come in. They bought what they think will be her last car. And they're trying to sell her car. You want to take this lead? And I said, yeah. So I call the guy up and I go out to see him. He bum a ride from my boss. We have to see him. And he's a tough negotiator. He said, I bought my mom her last car. She's trying to sell this car. It was a green 69 Pontiac Le Mans. We called it Big Green. And uh, <laughs> perfect, man, perfect, you know. Had a few dents in the side because she couldn't park in underground parking. A little old lady. Literally was a little old lady. And he said, I think I could talk mom into taking $300. And I had $350. I said, sold. So again, 300 bucks. And I got mm. my car. Now, where are you going to go find an apartment, get a job and a car for under $500? I had 50 bucks to spare. You're going to have to have a lot of help from a power greater than yourself. You know, mm. and my whole life has taken off since then. I mean, as long as I keep that in perspective, right? The third step is for me keeping it in perspective. Let God be God and me be his son and have him take care of me. And when that's the order of things, I'm letting God be God. And he, I'm his son. And he's taking care of me. And I'm trying to be a service to his kids. Then things happen incredibly fast. You can't keep up with it. And that's what's happened to me. And my life has been a dream in Dallas. Got my sponsor in Dallas. Got married in Dallas. Been married 27 years now to this lady. That's uh, wonderful. I married up. I'm a good salesman. I married up. And... Uh, mm -hmm. She's I saw her just second ago. Gal. Yeah, she's a beautiful gal. So that's how I've, that's how I've been in Dallas. It's still, uh, her and I started a business in Dallas. We we took 
family portraits. We grew that business to huge business. We took about 800 families a week in Dallas. We opened up a place in, in San Antonio, took about 150 in San Antonio. Houston, we took about 300 in Houston. Uh, Kansas City took about 100 families a week in, in, in uh, Kansas City. And we sold that in 2003. Got out of just in the right time because the iPhone put everybody out of business that taking pictures, mm. and uh, and fa- and in fact, it's uh, that that business no longer exists. I sold it and got out of it, and it no longer exists. You know, so at, then we we uh, she's a histologist now. She does she works with the pathologist, and I'm back in the insurance business. Work with seniors in Medicare, Medicare supplements, and retirement planning. That's what I do now. So. And it's been a marvelous, a marvelous time. But I got to keep that in perspective. I have to let God be God and me be his son and have him take care of me. And you can't keep up with it. It's incredible. John, this has been, re- I've enjoyed both of our sessions together. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, you're quite a guy. Um, you know, Thanks, I'm John. thinking that at some point, maybe you can come back and do, do you do the steps here around Dallas? Is that right? Yeah, I do them. I do them every month somewhere. Okay. So yeah, maybe right, we right can now, have you go ahead. I'm maybe sorry. we can have you come back and do uh just focus specifically on the steps, you know, okay. like steps one, two, three, four, five, six. And you know, a lot of people don't know this, but here in the the Texas area or the Dallas area at least, there we have certain speakers like yourself who go around and they will what we call do the steps, right? And it's usually They'll do steps one, two, three on one night of the week and four, five, six on the next and seven, eight, nine, and then 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Uh, that's the usual uh, cadence for all that. And maybe we can have you come back and do some of that at some other point. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, it'd be fine. Let's, let's, do, let's do miracles. Let's talk about miracles next time. What do you we'll mean? Have these times expect a miracle. Let's talk yeah. about miracles. Okay. Yeah, no, you miracle. got it. I love would you. love to do that. That's Expect we'll a miracle. So, yeah. like, in other words, just talk about the various miracles that you have seen and or experienced during sobriety. Is that the yeah. general idea of it? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Well, we'll, we'll, okay. Talk, we'll, 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 uh, we'll cover, uh, going back to the, the uh, meetings and the process. And so we'll cover... Uh, 10, 11, and 12, because that's where the miracles start to, the miracles, they're all around. They've, they've been, my, as you can tell from my, my story getting here, it was a miracle. And I think that God is so intimately involved in our life that you can't keep up with him. And we're right. going to cover and, all of those miracles in 10, 11, and, and we barely touched on your 39 years yeah. within the program. Yeah. And so I'm sure some of that will come up uh, during our time together. A lot of it. Well, so that'd be, let me know when. I'm, I'm happy anytime. Let me jam. This has been me, but. great. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, John A. And uh, once again, I'm going to close it out with page 164 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to Him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us like me and Mr. John A. As you trudge the road of happy destiny, may God bless you and keep you until then. Once again, John, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, John. I enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Once again, thank you, Mr. Reno, John. I so much enjoy spending time with you. And I already have Reno, John, rescheduled to come back in to Sober Speak for another episode or maybe two, you never can tell, and talk about miracles in AA. Expect a miracle. All right. Now, on to a little bit of listener feedback. By the way, if you want to contact John or any of the other speakers, feel free to send me an email to John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com, and I will make sure that they receive your message. All right, 
Now, on to a little bit of listener feedback for you. Laura writes in, and Laura says, Hi, my name is Laura. I am almost 10 months sober in in parentheses this time. I've been in and out of AA here in Roseburg, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. I don't know how you pronounce that. Anyway, for seven years, this go round, I got serious about getting a sponsor and working the steps. Rigorous honesty, not lacking. I'm pressing on one day at a time. I'm feeling the changes in me by the peaceful days without chaos. Yes. Seeing the changes by the decisions I make, always striving to do the next right thing. I'm recognizing my own growth and I now celebrate the fact that the promises are being fulfilled in me, something I never thought possible. I came across Sober Speak looking for an AA podcast to listen to. Well, I'm glad you found us, Miss Laura. And as soon as I get into my car and travel anywhere, Sober Speak comes on through the Bluetooth. I listen to, to Sober Speak about 80% of the time in my car. I've connected to a network. Uh, I'm connected to a network of sobriety through the speakers on your program. That's a good way to look at it. Oftentimes taking notes or sharing with others what I've gleaned from Sober Speak speakers. My meeting between meetings is an essential part of my day. It seems to me you're doing tradition five, carrying the message to the alcoholic. Yes. Oh, that touches me in a special way because that's exactly what I'm trying to do, Miss Laura. Thank you for what you're doing, and please keep on keeping on, double exclamation point, Laura. Will you keep on keeping on yourself, Miss Laura, and thank you for listening. Rebecca writes in, the Kiwi from New Zealand writes in, and she says, Kea Ora, John. She says, Reno John, which was the episode right before this. In fact, she's talking about Reno John part one was hilarious. And I'd have to agree with you, Miss Rebecca. He is something. I'll be waiting for the second installment. Well, you just got to hear it. And she says, I've never heard the saying, two dinglings don't make a bell. (laughs) But I think I'll be adding that to my repertoire. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that we can provide a service uh, that adds to your repertoire. (laughs) Oh, that John, uh, Reno John. She says, and thanks to you and the team for the Sober Speak live Zoom meeting. It was brilliant. She's talking about the one with uh, Bill C. Well, thank you. Uh, it took a team to put it on and thank you for uh, mentioning uh, all of us. I appreciate it. Ka kite ano, which means in Kiwi language. See you later. Is that what you call that? Kiwi language? I don't know. Uh, New Zealand language. But anyway, uh, she says kia ora. I always hear that one. I'm used to that one now, but now it's a kai ka kite ano. See ya later alligator. Well, I just threw on the alligator part, but you get the idea. Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. George B writes in. He says, hi, John. I retired to the Philippines, Angeles city last summer, and I'm 26 years sober with 12 years in Al-Anon. I miss Bill C's talk, uh, and he referred me to you to catch it. He's a longtime friend, but I've, I haven't had time to hear the other speakers yet. My plate is full with here with three local meetings. I'm hosting and all the others in LA. My home group is Roxbury Men's Stag and elsewhere that are now available. I'll get there to listen in to your uh, uh, a pod, to your other episodes, George B. Well, George B., once you get to it, you got a lot of catching up to do, my friend, but thank you for listening. I sure do appreciate it. Kathy writes in, and Kathy's is a little bit of a longer one, and uh, but, but I thought there was a lot of good information in here, so I'm going to read it. John, uh, she, actually, there's a poem that she started out with. Is it poem or poem or poem? Anyway, it's a weird word. I've, I've always had a struggle with that word. Exactly how, how doth one pronounce the word poem? Anyway, I think, that, I think I had it right there, but it sounds so official when I do it that way. Nonetheless, Kathy says, or she, or she started with a poem, poem, poem. <laughs> 
It says, this is what you shall do. Love the earth and the sun and the animals. Despise riches. Give alms to everyone that ask. Stand up for the stupid and crazy. Devote your income and labor to others. Hate tyrants. Argue not concerning God. Have patience and, and indulgence towards people. Take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any man or number of men go freely with powerful uneducated persons and with the young and the mothers of families re-examine all you have been told in school or church or in any book and dismiss whatever insults your own soul and your very flesh to be a great poem and I have the richest fluency, not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and faces between the lashes of your eyes and in every motion and joint of your body. And that is by Walt Whitman. It's the preface to Leaves of grass. If anybody wants to look that up and she says, Kathy says, I stumbled upon the poem above and I just wanted to share it with someone. I hope you enjoy it as well. Then she goes on and she says, hi, John, I've been listening to your podcast for over a month now and it has touched me in so many ways. The speakers always captivate me and I relate to all of them. I grew up in a high functioning home with many isms. I was the youngest of four kids and the only girl. My job was to help my mom as we lived on a farm slash ranch. I learned at a very young age how to be a caretaker, pretend all was perfect, and to live in fear. I learned those lessons very well. I also grew up with a drinking I also grew up drinking with my mom. Every time someone stopped by to visit, it wasn't unusual for them to have a drink. I loved taking a sip from my mom's, mom's drinks and it always seems like we shared a secret when I did. I'm your typical alcoholic as I never felt I belonged, fit in, or was perfect enough. I grew up believing that my mom always wanted me to be more, more, more pretty, more outgoing, more popular, just always more. I love my mom. Uh, and have always and always will. And I know she just did the best she possibly could do. The first time I got drunk, I was around age three or four as I snuck up into our spare refrigerator full of beer. I don't remember it, but it was just the beginning. My dad, my dad died when I was 15 and that was a blow that I never dealt with. I just pretended to be fine. That's when my life began its downward spiral, and I lived there for the next five decades. At the age of 19, I was slipped a date rape, date rape drug, which became another spiraling episode in which I gladly sought refuge in drinking. At 26, I married someone who drank as much as I did. I felt that no one else would have me. Oh, gosh, you hear that a lot. And at least I could continue drinking. At the beginning of our relationship, I was the raging alcoholic, and he controlled my drinking to where we would only begin drinking after 5 p.m., just as my dad had controlled my mom's drinking until he died. I was blessed with three beautiful children, and once I found out I was pregnant, I did stop drinking, but quickly went back to it after each delivery with encouragement from my spouse. Our oldest, child, our oldest child had several medical conditions and learning disabilities that I now believe was a result of his difficult childbirth. I stopped drinking on June 24th, 2003 because I had forgot to give my son his anti-seizure medicine for the second time because I was too drunk. Today, I realized I was able to quit only by the grace of God. The next 17 years, I lived as a dry drunk with an active drinker. When I was drinking, I at least had a tool to survive, and I was drinking to black out. 
Living as a dry drunk, I became a zombie who became so such a severe codependent and I gave everything of myself away. I had nothing left in me. I couldn't even pretend any more. Years of stuffing all my emotions, stuffing away, I just completely shattered. That was when I found the programs of AA and Al-Anon, and that was because I had nowhere else to go. My recovery began a year ago, May 2019. I still live with an active drinker because I still have nowhere else to go. There's nothing to salvage from our marriage And he's a very sick person. I continue to work the steps and one day I hope to move on. The programs are giving me my faith back, which was dead as my soul and my mind. I'm climbing out of the abyss of what I've only known and how to exist. I still find it hard to let people in after spending a lifetime of keeping everyone at an arm's length. It remains extremely difficult not to cry at meetings, even after a year, as a result of non-living, of only existing and pretending, but I am better than I used to be, just not where I need to be. Drinking is just but a symptom of being an alcoholic. The isms were all learned in our mental physical, and spiritual. Today, I am learning new tools on how to live my life. Someday, I will be free and to be and be able to experience joy and happiness that so many of you have found. The perfectionism I once coveted is less now, and unfortunately, it all takes time. I can say I don't hate myself or find myself worthless. I still live with the pain that lives inside, but it's becoming less. John, I'm sorry this is so long, but I want to thank you for all you do and your guests do for us alcoholics. There is a solution, and I'm finding mine one step at a time. I truly love your podcast, and I listen to it each day as I walk my dogs. Well, tell your dogs we said hello. There is much more to my story, but that's for another letter. Sincerely and ever grateful, Kathy. Gosh, there's so much in there, Kathy. Um, I don't want to really give advice, um, but I do want to say thank you for opening up, for being vulnerable. Just keep on keeping on. Keep doing what you're doing one step at a time, one day at a time. And you are not alone, Miss Kathy. And if there's anybody else out there listening right now and you think you're alone, you are not alone, my friend. Thanks for listening. God bless you all. Love you. Keep coming back. It works if you work it.